Hi guys, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Finny, your local guy in the nuclear world. In this project, we ask 10 questions to break theories and myths about everything nuclear in simple terms and with remarkable experts. In this episode, we ask 10 questions about nuclear wars to Dmitry Stefanovich, who is a research fellow at the Center for National Security of Imam al He is also co-founder of a Telegram channel, What For? 17k followers. He is also a nuclear Twitter celebrity, almost 11k followers. He knows a lot about strategic security, strategic stability, nuclear weapons, and emerging technologies. So please welcome. Hi Dmitri, thanks for being with me here today. And without further ado, first question to you. Which states have nuclear weapons? Uh, well, it's a nice uh, kickstart of our discussion. Well, currently we have uh, quite a number of states who actually have nuclear weapons. We have five official nuclear weapon states. Those are the US, Russia, China, France and the United Kingdom. And then we have, uh, and those five countries, they are basically allowed to have nuclear weapons under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Then we have uh, two nuclear weapon states uh, they, uh, in South Asia, those are India and Pakistan, which are not parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and uh, basically they claim that uh, their nuclear weapons are only against each other, more or less, and that's why they don't want to discuss it with anyone, and so on. We have two other nuclear weapon states uh, in rather different situations. We have Israel, who obviously has nuclear weapons, but never publicly acknowledged this capability, and we have North Korea, who has nuclear weapons, who publicly acknowledge this capability and who frequently uh, tests nuclear delivery systems and also actually, as we are talking, probably preparing for yet another nuclear test. Why I've mentioned uh, India and Pakistan uh, separately is also because uh, those two countries uh, show kind of a pathway to other possible nuclear weapon states because they were, when they've tested their nuclear explosive devices in the 90s and when they've uh, publicly announced their nuclear capable states, nuclear weapon states, mm -hmm. of course, there was uh, a brief uh, t uh, time period of uh, international outrage, of sanctions, but this period was not long enough. And basically, right now, the fact that both India and Pakistan, for different reasons, but enjoy uh, quite uh, well-developed uh, international cooperation in economy, in military, in military technology, and even in peaceful nuclear technology, uh, shows that, uh, well, other countries like North Korea can hope for such outcome later on. And the second question to you, what are the existing myths about nukes? Uh, well, of course, nuclear weapons, as many other issues of global importance uh, uh, lead to quite a number of myths being developed about, uh, around them. One of these myths is actually that uh, nuclear weapons are not so bad and basically now we have conventional weapons that are as capable as nuclear weapons. And I think this is one of the most uh, dangerous myths that, that uh, exist because uh, actually partly due to the fact that we haven't seen actual live nuclear tests for quite a while, some people uh, simply can't imagine the level of destructive power that can be unleashed by a nuclear weapon. And I'm not speaking about long-term radiological effects of radioactivity, of uh, radiation and so on. I'm speaking about rather short-term but very explicit uh, things like blast waves, heat waves, light, and so on. Uh, there is simply no other uh, weapon or, or no other uh, natural capability that can compare, can be compared by the level of destructiveness. And uh, one big example is this uh, huge tragedy that we witnessed uh, in Lebanon uh, several years ago with a huge explosion uh, in the port that destroyed a serious part of the city, but according to estimation, this explosion is only a fraction of what even the least powerful uh, nuclear weapons that are currently stockpiled can lead to. 
So hopefully people will be more uh, careful when they talk about nuclear weapons and compare those to conventional weapons. And it leads to linked, is linked to yet another myth about nuclear weapons, that somehow a world without nuclear weapons will be a much safer place. Unfortunately, history and even recent history uh, shows that we as uh, mankind are very good in developing tools to destroy each other. And uh, if we look at pictures of uh, quite a number of cities, not only after the Second World War, but even in uh, Syria or now in Ukraine, uh, on, in Iraq and Libya, in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, uh, and also we see that uh, if we need to de uh, destroy a city, it will be destroyed without any nuclear weapons. And this is actually a much bigger challenge than getting rid of nuclear weapons. I mean, the challenge is to uh, create a global architecture, global security architecture that would simply uh, make it, if not impossible, but simply uh, unnecessary uh, to uh, destroy uh, such huge uh, volume of infrastructure and uh, lead to uh, such enormous human suffering that we see right now. Uh, as my senior colleagues often say, a nuclear-free world is not the current world minus nuclear weapons. It should be something entirely different. You already started talking about it, but can you tell us more about deterrence? What is deterrence? Basically, we have quite well-developed theories of deterrence, uh, and I believe Americans uh, are the best in this case. But at the same time, uh, those are theories. We have quite limited real-world practice, real-world knowledge that contributes uh, to our understanding of how deterrence and especially nuclear deterrence work. At the same time, the fact is that we haven't seen uh, a major conflict between great powers, uh, direct conflict uh, during the nuclear era. Uh, but the belief is that uh, those remain fairly limited uh, largely due to the fact that uh, nuclear weapons deterred the uh, further deterred further escalation. Uh, another issue is that uh, to work, the deterrence should be credible, and it basically works uh, in the minds of the people who make decisions. And uh, here we have another big issue because uh, sometimes it is good enough just to be transparent about your capability. But then your adversary or your partner might uh, have concerns and second thoughts about whether you will be willing to actually use nuclear weapons. Uh, so these concepts, they are very interesting, but uh, the if and how they work in real life uh, remains uh, questionable to some extent. So Dmitry, thank you for touching up already on that particular question about the nuclear war. So can you tell me, is there a possible scenario of nuclear war? Well, uh, yes, there are scenarios of nuclear war. And while those are still uh, a bit far from unraveling, it doesn't mean that we should not research those. Uh, one quite popular idea is that uh, nuclear war can uh, escalate from a conventional conflict, either due to uh, early use of nuclear weapons by one side, uh, which considers itself an inferior position, or through inadvertent escalation when both sides continuously increase the stakes all the way to nuclear use. Uh, another way we can see actual uh, nuclear escalation is that we have a conflict, but instead of using a battlefield nuclear weapon, one side decides basically to send a message through a so-called signal strike uh, by uh, launching a long-range uh, nuclear delivery vehicle either somewhere in the ocean or in a desert or somewhere towards the adversary's territory but uninhabited part of it. Uh, and lastly, of course, uh, we should not forget about the possibility of an all-out nuclear war, so-called uh, strike out of the blue. Uh, which can, uh, which basically means that one side decides that it's better for them to destroy the adversary for some reason. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we should also not rule out the possibility of uh, some accidental case uh, 
uh, because as long as uh, nuclear weapons are deployed, there is always a small chance that something will go wrong. And actually, uh, that's why personally I believe that as long as we have nuclear weapons, we should keep the investments in those uh, relatively stable and so on, simply to avoid them uh, rusting away and to keep the operators uh, in good shape and things like that. So, uh, yes, uh, there are scenarios for nuclear war, but uh, we're still quite far from those. And uh, also, the biggest challenge is not the use itself, but the possible normalization of nuclear use. Because so far we have nuclear taboo, which is, uh, seems impenetrable. We have public declaration of the P5, of the NPT nuclear weapon states I've listed earlier, that uh, reiterated the so-called Gorbachev-Reagan formula that uh, nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. So it seems that there is a more or less universal understanding of the consequences. It's good news and good to know <laughs> that we were a little bit far from that at least. And that leads to the fifth question uh, from me to you. If not deterrence, then what? Is there any alternative to deterrence that you see as feasible alternative? Uh, well, of course, the best uh, solution would be to at least couple deterrence with some sort of confidence building measures, of risk reduction measures, of arms control, mm -hmm. because otherwise they will, we actually end up into, in arms racing. And we've already been there. And uh, I think the biggest takeaway is uh, no matter how much you invest in your offensive and defensive nuclear and conventional and other capabilities, uh, you will not feel safe as long as your adversary still retains a uh, possibility of, uh, sec of credible second strike or, or even uh, of credible uh, warfighting capability on the regional scale. Because uh, the only way out is just to be sure about the capabilities of your adversary and this can be done only in exchange of demonstrating some level of transparency about your own capabilities. While, of course, uh, there are limits to the functionality of such regimes, and it is always a challenge to establish such a regime, I believe this is where uh, the global efforts uh, of the research community and of, this, of diplomats, of uh, military analysts, this is where their efforts uh, should take place. No. <laughs> Thank you, Dmitry, for again acknowledging that confidence building measures and arms control are very important instruments. And going a little bit further from that topic, but more on a public level topic, uh, since the nuclear, nuclear war or everything nuclear has become so hyped uh, recently, what do you think are the ways to identify whether nuclear related news is fake? Well, that's a really good question. And I think that it is not that different from uh other sorts of fake news because the first question you should ask yourself is what is the source of, of this news and when you identify this source you should uh, ask yourself uh, why this source might be interested in disseminating this information uh, another idea is just uh, to check whether what is uh, being told being described in the piece of, of information that you consider not uh, either too sensational or not very reliable uh, just to check what is said about this in other sources that you consider credible there is of course always a problem that uh, basically all of us live in some sort of uh, information bubbles uh, but i believe that uh, for a well educated person uh, it might be uh, easy to find a credible source of information Another important uh, factor is that one should, uh, especially in times where we have uh, active uh, military conflicts, uh, not to believe anything that is being said by either side of uh, military conflict, not because those uh, always lie or because uh, one side always lies, but simply because in these cases the information they are disseminating is being driven by uh, other factors mainly the well the, the military situation not by the desire to uh, publish truth and only truth 
Again, coming back to your original question, I think to spot fake news about nuclear weapons, you should simply uh, look for the source and then uh, look what people with uh, well with good nuclear portfolio, uh, with, who work in credible uh, think tanks, think uh, or write or say about the similar issues. The other question is related to a little bit different realm, the climate realm, because I think nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons are very, very closely connected to climate if they are actually used. So, what do you think are the climatical consequences of nuclear weapon use? Uh, I think the major uh, scenario that have been researched uh, back in the day and sometimes is being researched right now is that the massive nuclear use or even limited nuclear use can lead to well not global warming but exp exp exactly the opposite to something like a nuclear winter and even if it will not be a global result and actually as far as i understand now there are serious uh, questions whether this scenario of a global nuclear winter uh, is credible uh, because now we have much uh, bigger simulation capabilities and data that we have uh, that we've had during the, the 80s or the 70s uh, even a regional conflict uh, can uh, affect uh, the crops the uh, livestock dramatically and lead to global hunger and things like that not to mention the very explicit uh, results of uh, devastating results of nuclear use uh, exactly at the regions where those are used because uh, as I've said earlier even with discounting the long-term uh, radiological effects uh, the blast waves the heat waves will lead to enormous destruction and what how it affects climate well basically it, because of uh, massive burns uh, we see a formation of uh, clouds of um, ash which uh, then affects the climate. There is a little bit of a, a, a wider scale question from my side. Question number eight. Do you think it's possible that if nuclear war starts, the humanity actually survives? Uh, yes, I think the humanity can survive a nuclear war as long as the war fighting does not lead to uh, full destruction of our planet. But uh, it will be uh, not uh, not a pleasant uh, survival, not a pleasant life afterwards. As uh, my good friend uh, says, uh, for example, if you uh, worse than uh, dying in a nuclear conflict uh, when you live in Moscow would be to survive a nuclear conflict when you live in Moscow, simply because the aftermath uh, of uh, nuclear use will basically destroy the society uh, as we have, destroy all the infrastructure and so on. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no efforts to minimize the outcomes. And uh, during the Cold War, actually, there were very serious uh, investments in creating the uh, mechanisms, the shelters, the vaults uh, to keep people, uh, at least some sh uh, fraction of people uh, alive and uh, well afterwards after nuclear exchange because simply full protection uh, even deep underground or in ro in mountains or, or so on is infeasible but also at least it seems and at current stage current levels of uh, nuclear arsenals the uh, uh, total, uh, even if all those nuclear weapons would be blown up, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, the humanity will die simply because, uh, well, our planet is actually rather big and we have uh, some places where probably no one will target uh, their weapons simply because there might be not enough of those. Yeah, well, and hopefully it will never happen. But if it happens, can you give some of practical advice for just people of 2022 how to survive a nuclear war if something uh, like well happens. again hopefully nothing like that happened but probably if something if, so yeah, hopefully, if something moved this way is just uh, to get as far from major cities as possible uh, and from military installations as well and actually this is uh, an interesting uh, case uh, we can even put it into the myth section or 
right here, uh, there are uh, two main uh, types of, uh, well, targeting doctrine for nuclear war planners, which is counterforce and counter value. One is that you target uh, only adversary, well, military war fighting capabilities, and of course their decision makers. Uh, other is that you target basically the all of its infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, factories, uh, everything, and cities. So one say you try to basically disarm your adversary, another is you try to destroy your adversary. Uh, as a functioning society, this is the words that were used. Uh, but the biggest problem is that, uh, well, it is quite hard to find a situation where all military infrastructure or all military production capabilities are detached from the major cities. Uh, and uh, basically, you can uh, describe, if you really want to, you can describe uh, almost everything as a military capability. And uh, in this case, uh, and considering the uh, destructive power of nuclear weapons that I've mentioned earlier, uh, for the uh, country that is on the receiving end of, of such a nuclear scenario, it doesn't, uh, and for people in this country, it doesn't really matter whether you are planning counter force or counter value strike. In any case, uh, well, the destruction will be enormous. So, again, uh, the biggest suggestion is just to make sure to be as far away from uh, both major population centers and major military installations. Just to follow up, what if, for example, you are, I don't know, in a big city, where do you go? Like, do you go to the underground? Uh, yeah, un uh, underground can uh, uh, help you survive for some time, especially if the blasts happen quite far away. Uh, you probably should learn uh, if there are any shelters nearby, because actually there are quite a number of shelters that are being built or have been built. But the problem is, as I've said, those shelters uh, do not offer protection about uh, actual uh, uh, nuclear blasts that are targeted somewhere near. It is just like uh, if uh, something blows up quite far away from you, then probably it is better to be somewhere underground than uh, in a high-rise building. But apart from that, uh, if you are somewhere near the so-called ground zero, where the tar the cross, mo uh, if you find yourself in the crosshairs, uh, it's uh, impossible to find a scenario where you will actually survive. What is Doomsday Clock? Why is it ticking? And how can we actually create more seconds to midnight and more minutes to midnight. Well, actually, uh, well, originally it was a great concept uh, by the Belton of Atomic Scientists. I think uh, for the last uh, decade or so, it actually lost uh, a serious part of its, uh, well, usefulness or usability uh, because those people, for all the good reasons, started to include threats uh, that uh, are not explicitly nuclear in these uh, calculations, including like cyber, climate, environment, uh, f uh, hybrid warfare and things like that. This basically leads to the fact where we actually at the moment are probably quite close uh, to a nu nuclear conflict if we use their calculations. Uh, but the clock are at the same part, uh, at the same stage as they were a year ago, and uh, well, I'm not sure that this is appropriate. Uh, so I think, but it, at the same time, uh, credit where credit is due, uh, these people are very good in drawing our attention to the uh, to all sorts of uh, issues, and while we can agree to disagree that some of these issues are less important or more important. It doesn't mean that we should simply throw away these or that problems. And my personal perception is that uh, to reverse the trend, uh, we need to actually restart the discussions on uh, nuclear threats. Uh, and one good example, actually two examples of what I'm trying to say, is that uh, probably there was a one of the biggest nuclear-related outrages in the expert community war uh, happened when uh, Donald Trump administration released their nuclear posture review, uh, the U.S. nuclear posture review, uh, the basically main document that explains how the Americans view their nuclear weapons uh, and nuclear weapons of other states. 
And when they released it in 2018, well, many people criticized it and for all the good reasons. But what was important that it simply reminded everyone that, well, we have nuclear weapons and uh, there are people who are thinking about the possible scenarios of their use, of how deterrence works and so on. And uh, it's not like this, those nuclear weapons will simply go away uh, themselves. Uh, there should be effort, the efforts should be made to actually create a situation where those are no longer needed. And uh, I think to some extent this nuclear posture review contributed to the development of this nuclear ban movement, which uh, from my perspective doesn't seem really helpful, but still it is a symptom that there are a lot of things that are going wrong with nuclear weapons. And one of the reasons for that, uh, again, that is my personal understanding, is that uh, people in many countries or even in most countries uh, do not care about the threat perception of their partners and their adversaries. They simply disregard that uh, some people, uh, some decision makers might have an absolutely different worldview and a different uh, perception, again, of uh, what you are doing. Uh, so it is necessary not only just to try to calm everyone down and say that, no, you are wrong, that's not what we are planning. It actually much more important to try to understand why your counterpart thinks the way he thinks or perceives the situation the way he perceives it, not just trying to simply throw away all his concerns. So, talking in diplomacy and uh, all this should be done in good faith. This is uh, my personal uh, solution. Unfortunately, we're still quite far from there. Dmitry, thank you so much for being with me today here. I'm sure our audience learned a lot from you today and enjoyed every bit of it. It was Nuclear Pep Talk and me, Xenia, your guide to the nuclear world. And remember, fear is here. Learn about nuclear. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. Thanks guys again for watching. I really appreciate it if you press the like button to like this video, subscribe if you want to see more of the Nuclear Pep Talk very, very soon. I mean, you've been this video making platform, so if you support me, I really, really appreciate it. And for those who have done everything, a little nuclear treat, a nuclear acronym of the day. And today it is MAD. No, I'm not MAD. MAD is a mutually assured destruction. Basically, it's a doctrine that states that the effects of the exchange of nuclear strikes will be so devastating that no state will actually use it. What it means in simple terms is that if one country uses nuclear weapons, the other one will for sure retaliate and that will lead to a total annihilation. That's why no one does it. And that's why nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Thank you. See you soon.